Alrighty, so today I will be talking about uh, what's often referred to as esoteric Buddhism, um, particularly in the East Asian context. Um, I covered some of the issues related to the Tantra in the Tibetan episode. Um, so this, this one will primarily focus on the East Asian tradition. Um, as always, uh, my name is Aaron Prophet. I'm an associate professor of Japanese studies at the University at Albany SUNY. Uh, this is my uh, uh, email address if you'd like to, to reach out and ask any questions about this video. Um, so let, let us begin. Um, in order to really talk about what esoteric Buddhism is and how it's been understood, we have to take a slight detour and talk about the tantras, um, and as well as the various discourses around the tantras. Now, um, we get this term tantric Buddhism, and you know it's kind of a question, how does this relate to this phrase esoteric Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism and so on? Um, there uh, are many genres of ritual manuals that include you know, complex ritual uh, altars, uh, visualizations to be done while performing a ritual, uh, various body postures, mantras and spells and so on. And there are many genres of ritual texts that deal with it, deal with these things. And one of them is called the Tantras, right? Uh, which was rendered as a, a, a Giki or Igwe, a, a Igwe in Chinese, Giki uh, in Japanese, um, as, in, in various other terms as well. Um, in the um, um, in later Indian Buddhism, in Tibetan Buddhism, and Chinese Buddhism to some extent, uh, but we have this term Vajrayana. Um, uh, Kongo Jo uh, in Japanese um, that we find associated with the Tantras. Uh, the word Vajra means uh, indestructible, like a diamond, or or, or or you know sudden, like a lightning bolt. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the Buddhist traditions that describe Buddha nature as somehow you know indes indestructible, like a diamond, or that the attainment of Buddhahood is sudden or rapid through the. Per per to the performance of these ritual practices, uh, it, it get, gives the traditions concerned with the Tantras this name, Vajrayana. Um, another term that we associate with Tantric traditions is esoteric. Um, many Buddhist traditions, uh, you know, Tantric traditions included, uh, often talk about the secret or esoteric teachings of a Buddha um, that uh, um, have both uh, uh, inner uh, as well as apparent uh, meaning. So esoteric, inner, secret meanings, and uh, you know, literal, apparent, or exoteric meanings. Um, so the, this is common across many Buddhist lineages, but uh, when we're dealing with the Tantra's uh, secrecy uh, and kind of reading things on many, many levels, deeper and deeper, more and more es esoteric, uh, is, is a way of thinking about uh, Buddhist knowledge we find associated with the so-called uh, tantric traditions. All right, <clears throat> so Buddhist traditions that restrict access to knowledge only to those who are initiated. So in order to practice the tantras, you have to be initiated into a lineage, have a teacher, uh, and so on. So that, that for that reason, some tantric traditions refer to themselves as esoteric Buddhism. Okay. So like I said, one of the key aspects of this genre we call the tantras uh, as well as the you know, uh, Tibetan Vajrayana traditions, East Asian esoteric traditions, again, is secrecy and initiation, right? In order to be a member uh, of, of these uh, traditions, in order to learn how to practice Tantra, you need a teacher. And many Tantric traditions really emphasize the dominant role of the teacher, that without the teacher's guidance, your uh, you know, what you're doing could be dangerous uh, without the proper guidance. Um, but what's interesting, though, is that despite the fact that these teachings are supposedly secret, by, let's say, the ninth century, we see esoteric lineages in India, Indonesia, Tibet, China, Japan, etc. So it's like esoteric Buddhism is the worst kept secret in the history of world religions because these lineages proliferate, right? So it seems to me that the idea of secrecy is actually a marketing tactic, you could say, or it's a way of kind of drawing people in. The way I explain it to my students is, um, if I tell you I have a secret, what is your reaction? Students immediately say, well, I wanna know. I wanna know what, what is the secret? I'm like, yeah, like if I tell you I have a secret, your reaction is not, oh, well, I will respect your privacy. No, your reaction is like, tell me more about that, right? So by calling tantric lineages secret or esoteric, 
um, that makes people want to learn more about them and then that helps the tradition grow. So we have monks and emperors, scholars, as well as marginal lay people that uh, in various degrees, various places might participate or draw upon these traditions. So even though the esoteric traditions are commonly associated with court Buddhism or the Buddhism of the aristocrats and elites, we often find bits and pieces of tantric culture kind of breaking off and moving off into the provinces where people are kind of using esoteric ritual techniques to uh, make contact with gods, Buddhas, bodhisattvas, and so on. Um, tantric texts often draw upon royal and militant imagery. Okay, the vajra, which can mean diamond, you know, a diamond or a lightning bolt, uh, is also a symbol for a club used for bashing your enemies on the battlefields of medieval India. So this is a very militant image that we find ubiquitous in tantric art and literature and ritual and so on. Um, there's also a strong emphasis on the idea of visualizing yourself as a kind of divine king at the center of a palace or a realm that you are the lord of. Um, so this kind of play on militant imagery also uh, leans into royal imagery. So whether you're a king or not, you might visualize yourself as, the, as a king in a palace uh, in the context of the ritual uh, visualization and contemplation. <clears throat> One of the things you might do with a tantric ritual is call upon the power of a Buddha, Bodhisattva, or God and become them, okay? So some of these rituals begin by kind of setting out a uh, perimeter, okay? Like, uh, like, like on a battlefield or you know, like a moat around a palace to protect your, um, you know, the, to protect your, your practice, yeah? Uh, then perhaps, t you know, using mantras and visualizations to imagine putting on the armor uh, to, to do battle. The practitioner will then, through the recitation of mantras and visualizations and performance of mudras, the uh, secret hand uh, movements, call a Buddha, Bodhisattva, or God to come from their pure land or, or their abode into the ritual space. You then greet this being as if they are an honored guest, you know, with many different kinds of offerings, uh, 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 fragrant oils, incense, candles, uh, food offerings, etc. Um, through the um, the use of mudras, so these these you know, secret hand um, motions, um, through the recitation of mantras or spells or dadani, and through the visualization or contemplation or worship of mandalas, your body, speech, and mind are revealed to be one and the same with the body, speech, and mind of ultimate reality, or the, the particular Buddha, Bodhisattva, or God, or Vidya Raja that you might be drawing upon. Um, once the uh, ritual is complete, uh, in some cases, you're said to have the power of this being to then do things in the world, things like rain-making rituals, extending the lifespan of the emperor, slaying your enemies on the battlefield, attaining rebirth in a pure land, or, becoming a Buddha within this very body. And then once the ritual is complete, you then send this Buddha or Bodhisattva back to where they go, ring the bell and, and so on, right? So this is a kind of ritual grammar. You invite the deity, you become the deity, and then you send the deity uh, away. Um, in some cases, it's understood that these two things are coming together, but you know, on a deeper level, it's also understood that uh, ordinary beings and these divine Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are really one and the same all along. Um, <clears throat> in some tantric texts, there's an emphasis on the corporeality of awakening, the, the idea that your very human body, uh, you know, warts and all, limitations, bad habits, that that itself is in some sense an expression of ultimate reality. So that then includes human sexuality. There are some tantric texts that, that I've seen discussed from medieval Japan that even discuss um, the bodhisattva of compassion as manifesting within amorous relationships, or even turning it around, amorous relationships themselves as an expression of the bodhisattva of compassion. Uh, in any case, uh, along with the vajra uh, as a common image, we also see the lotus as a common image, and it's pretty easy to see how this could be uh, reflect gendered uh, uh, language here. Um, in some traditions, there is the description of kind of divine sexual union that between Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, between a Buddha, Bodhisattva, and the practitioner, um, and so on. 
And this uh, represents cosmic unity, the idea that all things are ultimately interconnected and non-dual. Uh, the unity of Buddha and practitioner, the, the holy Buddhas and the mundane sentient beings are really not two separate things. So this emphasizes non-dualism. Um, we also see that the, uh, a strong emphasis on female sexuality, female power, and uh, the appearance of female Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, uh, somewhat more so in tantric literature than we would see in, shall we call it mainstream Mahayana Buddhism. So again, to you know, uh, one of the ritual practices we see are the use of mudras. Now, mudras are very helpful to know because if you see a Buddha image, you can tell, oh, that's Amitabha, that's the medicine Buddha, that's Shakyamuni, uh, etc. Um, so we'll see these, 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 you know, hand positions, kind of, uh, you know, as symbols for the body of a Buddha, right? Uh, and by performing the same, you know, posture or, you know, a hand uh, sign, uh, you are manifesting bodily uh, that Buddha within the world or that aspect of the Buddha uh, within yourself uh, in the ritual uh, environment. Next, we have mantras. Uh, mantras uh, are, you know, like you might say, you know, um, mantras often include the name of, of the deity. So the, one of the mantras for Maitreya is just Om, begins with the letter Om, Maitreya Svaha, I think. Um, so it's just, the, you know, it's like saying, yo, Maitreya, or something like that. So you're calling upon them with the mantra, Om Maitreya Svaha, Om Maitreya Svaha, and then different Buddhas and Bodhisattvas will have different mantras associated with them. Now, mantra is generally fairly short. Uh, you know, the name, you know, like uh, Om Marori Kya Svaha, one of the mantras for the Bodhisattva, the compassion. Sometimes they're much longer ones. A, a Dharani may be a few lines long, a whole paragraph long, a whole page long. Dadani are like mantras, but much, much longer. And a, a vidya is another type of thing you might chant, but also spells. Um, in some cases, the word mantra is translated as spell. Um, so th these are things that you can, these vocal utterances you can perform to um, affect things in the world. So uh, this one I have pictured here is the mantra of light. Um, Om which is a mantra that was recited uh, while sprinkling divinely charged sand over a corpse to send them to the pure land. Um, to the left, we have the syllable A, uh, um, which uh, represents emptiness and the original non-arising of dharmas uh, and, and is a, a form of meditation used in some esoteric traditions as kind of a um, a tantric answer to Zen meditation. It's very interesting that today in Japanese Buddhism how this is used. Um, in China, mantras were often rendered in, uh, into Chinese characters. Uh, whereas in Japan, um, the, the script for writing the mantras known as Siddham was preserved. Uh, so if you wanna read these fun tantric texts in you know, you know, classical Japanese, you need to know um, you know, the classical Chinese that the text is framed in, but also your ABCs in Sanskrit to sound out the mantra. It's, it's very, very challenging. Um, and here we have an image of a mandala. Um, I like to think of mandalas as a South Asian religious technology that, you know, uh, just like the tantras we find in various, various religions. Uh, the word mandala init initially means something just like circle. So you can imagine just like beginning just a circle that you might use in a visualization practice. Um, some people think of mandalas as a kind of meditation aid and that may be part of it. So uh, the, the description we find of the mandalas is almost like you're walking through a palace and there are all these different gates and all these different deities you meet along the way. Um, this one pictured here is the womb realm mandala, the Taizokai mandala, the uh, great compassion mandala. And it, uh, if you imagine you're looking at a palace top down and the Buddha in the center, Mahavarochana, is kind of the Lord of this palace, Lord of this realm. That is also a depiction of the universe in its quiescent form. It's, it's peaceful, not, you know, uh, uh, form. Um, mandalas are often treated as objects of devotion in their own right. So you go to a temple, it has a big mandala put up. It's not just for meditation, it's also for worship, you might say, as an object of devotion unto itself with, you know, uh, you know, various offerings set before it. Um, again, this kind of goes back to this idea of divine kingship, you know, visualizing yourself as the Buddha in the middle. And I even heard of a temple, I believe this is in Hawaii, that has the Buddha in the middle missing 
because when you look at the mandala, you are understood to be the Buddha in the center. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought that was kind of a cool idea. Yeah. Uh, but one of the other uh, practices we see associated with esoteric Buddhism are these votive fire rituals. Um, so on the right, we have a Hindu priest performing one of these sacred fire rituals. And on the left, we have a Japanese Buddhist priest uh, performing a similar ritual. Uh, scholars who work on these um, practices see it going all the way back, right? perhaps one of the earliest forms of organized human activity, according to uh, uh, Richard Payne, who has written extensively on the Homa ritual. Um, um, <clears throat> during the Homa ritual, what, uh, again, what one invokes the deity and the practitioner, the fire and the object of devotion, um, whether it's a Buddha or Bodhisattva, are understood to become one in the same. Yeah. And that through kind of, uh, but what people often do in some of these temples is they'll write uh, a wish on a piece of wood and that wood is then fed to the fire and then the smoke goes up uh, and, you know, kind of helps transmit that, that, that wish um, to the Buddha. So, uh, you know, the, people will do these fire rituals to purify negative karma, for good luck, for uh, success in an examination or business venture, safety and travel, and so on. So, uh, for various uh, what we sometimes call mundane and, and super mundane needs, you know, uh, healing uh, sickness, but also healing spiritual sickness in the next life. So, th there are many different ways that this particular ritual is used. I think it's really, really interesting. Um, so, again, so <clears throat> uh, the practice of the tantras is often said to be mind bending, kind of transforming what you think you know about human potential. And, and in some in some texts, people talk about magical powers. Yeah. So uh, in any good um, meditation tradition in ancient India, if you get good at yoga or meditation, you're said to also gain these magical powers. Um, some people use this as a way to explain upaya or skillful means. And this is a way of of understanding enlightenment in language that people can understand. Others look at uh, these tales of magic and mystery as ways of explaining shunyata or emptiness, that we, uh, we project coherence and um, ideas on the world that are really of our own creation. And these stories of kind of mind-bending magical events are a way of talking about breaking down your sense of reality to see things beyond what you think you know. Um, <clears throat> through the use of these tantric texts, uh, people are supposedly able to transform um, mundane or disgusting substances. Like here we have a, a skull cup filled with blood being drunk. Um, <clears throat> this is a symbol for <clears throat> transforming things that are impure into that which is pure. So an ordinary sentient being becoming like a Buddha, yeah. Um, many early scholars of Tantra really didn't understand what was going on. I don't know, these people eating, you know, you know, eating flesh and drinking blood. Or, uh, but there's actually a much deeper uh, literary philosophical way of reading what these texts are really talking about. Uh, and the so-called magical powers are re uh, referred to as Siddhi. Yeah, yeah we're going to skip. So um, again, uh, esoteric Buddhism is also commonly associated with what, what, what I call court Buddhism uh, uh, or Buddhism within the, the political realm. Um, South, Central, and East Asian kingdoms were in dialogue, and one of the things that circulated widely was esoteric Buddhism. Uh, during the Tang Dynasty, rulers employed Buddhists and non-Buddhists from various traditions. So you might have esoteric ritual masters, Chan or Zen meditation masters, Tiantai doctrinal masters, and their work might overlap. All right, these are not mutually exclusive, where they draw upon one another. Some scholars have looked at the way that lineage and the teacher to teacher student relationship functions within Chan. And some scholars have asked, does esoteric Buddhism, which seems to develop early on in, in China, does that influence what becomes of Chan, this you know, strong emphasis on, on you know, kind of direct teaching from the master and, and various other features as well. Um, one of the terms we often see in the East Asian context, uh, mi jiao uh, in Chinese or mi kyo in Japanese, uh, means the secret teachings. Um, and some scholars wonder, like, should we think of these practices as a new kind of Buddhism or simply a new ritual technology, a new way of using Mahayana rhetoric and ritual culture 
um, you know, in this context. So, you know, whether we think of it as an aspect of Mahayana Buddhism, or we think of it as a new school of Buddhism altogether, um, you know, this is an ongoing conversation within the field that I think is kind of fun to, to think, think through. <clears throat> right, let me skip that. All right, so um, it, during the Tang Dynasty, we have these three figures, Shubhakara Simha, Vajra Bodhi, and Amoga Vajra, that really kind of you know, establish the esoteric traditions at really the height of Tang Dynasty court Buddhism. Um, you know, again, th there's maybe some connection between Chan and esoteric Buddhism, but then in later Chinese dynasties, such as Yuan Dynasty, Ming Dynasty, Qing Dynasty, we also see the influx of Tibetan esoteric Buddhism or T Tibetan Vajrayana Buddhism into elite Chinese sphere. So even though we can't, we don't necessarily think of the lineage of you know, the, the great tantric masters like Amoga Vajra um, influence, you know, continuing on, rather we see kind of the broader esotericization of Chinese Buddhism, um, that, that these ideas and practices kind of just become part of Chinese religion uh, more broadly. So we're gonna hop over to Japan because that's the place where the East Asian traditions really begin to flourish, right? So in the early, um, you know, uh, d d r during the reign of Emperor Kanmu, um, there is a desire to re-establish contact with Chinese Buddhism to kind of update whatever's going on in Japan based on the Chinese model. So uh, they set out to send a mission to China. Um, this is in part due to some of the political intrigue in the old capital in Nara. The capital moves to Nagaoka Kyo and then finally Heian Kyo. And Heian means peace, right? So in order to establish this new peace, uh, the emperor wanted to, you know, an, an influx of new Chinese Buddhism. Um, one of the people that was sent on this mission is a monk named Sai Cho, and he ends up studying on Mount Tiantai. His goal was to go to the capital Chang'an, but instead his boat gets blown off course and he ends up in uh, eastern China on the, in the Tiantai region. He then comes back to Japan and establishes Enryakuji Temple on Mount Hiei, and you know, of the many important things that Saicho does, fighting for institutional autonomy from the Nara institution was really important. Nara, the old capital, was where all the old big aristocratic temples were, and they ran the show. Saicho, who had just brought back all this cool new stuff, including esoteric Buddhism, some Zen stuff, uh, Tiantai thought, he said, no, like, I'm going to train my monks my way. And he really emphasized that. Um, this was a gamble. Uh, this could have worked out very poorly for him because he didn't have the support structure that someone connected with Nara would have had, but that ended up paying off later on. You think about like, you know, the little trees fall, the big trees fall and the little trees rise, like during periods of instability, this institutionally autonomous form of Buddhism is able to, to then dominate. And indeed, the, the Tendai tradition we associate with Saicho does become the dominant or, or a dominant tradition in Japanese Buddhism. In China, Saicho studies the Tiantai tradition. Uh, Tiantai looks to the monk Zhir Yi as its founder, uh, called Tiantai Zhir Yi, uh, the great teacher of, uh, of uh, <clears throat> uh, Zhir Yi, the great teacher of Mount Tiantai. And like many other Chinese Buddhists at his time, he's trying to make sense of the diversity of Chinese Buddhism. Yeah. Zhir Yi develops a comprehensive meditation system, a comprehensive doctrinal system, uh, a, a way of organizing um, you know, and systematizing the various sutras. Uh, the term we use for this is pan jiao. Uh, but many different Buddhist thinkers have developed pan jiao to systematize the diversity of Buddhism. Juri was one of the first and one of the most influential. Uh, many later pan jiao are responding to Juri's approach to thinking about how all the different pieces of Buddhism fit together. One of the tools that Juri uses to think about diversity and unity in the Mahayana system is the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra presents the story of the burning house. Once upon a time, there was a man who came home, the house is on fire, and his children are playing unaware. Uh, he then tells them, I have three carts outside. If you come out now, you can play with the toys in these three carts, an ox cart, a deer cart, and, an, and a goat cart or sheep cart. Um, the children come outside and they realize that there's something even better uh, waiting for them, these glorious, you know, white oxes with the even better carts, and you know, you know, it, it's so much better, right? Um, and then um, uh, th this kind of symbolizes how we have the diversity of the Buddhist tradition, 
um, that is uh, actually kind of held together or unified by the idea of, of the single vehicle. Um, uh, within this system, there's also an understanding that um, Shakyamuni Buddha was not simply some Indian guy who lived a long time ago, but rather he is a, an aspect of reality that is guiding sentient beings to awakening, that Shakyamuni Buddha actually attained awakening in the infinite past. And the story we know about the prince who woke up and you know, achieved awakening is just one aspect of this broader uh, story. Um, and this is connected again with this concept of skillful means that different people receive different teachings according to their particular needs. This then, then once we get to Japan, this gives Saicho the ability uh, kind of drawing on the Tiantai tradition to build a comprehensive approach to Buddhism that includes uh, the, the monastic precepts or the Mahayana precepts, which Saicho emphasized, um, certain forms of meditation we call shamatha and vipassana or calming and insight meditation, um, as well as pure land practices, uh, which were part of the Tiantai system for calming the mind and reciting the name of the Buddha Amitabha, Namo, Namo Amida Butsu or Namo Amitofo in Chinese. Uh, as a way to maintain focus during meditation. So that leads to um, Tiantai figures in China and Japan inspiring independent Pure Land movements, uh, but also in the Japanese context, especially the integration of esoteric ritual practice into the Tiantai system. You know, it, it seems to be that, again, that, you know, this is kind of aristocratic court Buddhism. Um, they're trying to be kind of equal opportunity employer, just cover everything, right? Because you might have an aristocrat who says, hey, can you teach me how to meditate? Or can you pray for the, the pure land rebirth of, of my grandfather? Or can you, you know, do this esoteric ritual to help the emperor have a longer lifespan? Basically, they want to be able to do whatever they're called upon to do. So they master all these different areas of study. Um, some people have thought of Tendai as a, um, a, a Tendai is the Japanese pronunciation of the term Tiantai, which comes from China, right? Um, some people have, uh, often refer to Tendai as, being, as eclectic, because there's all these different things kind of all hanging together. But I think a better way to think about it is as a comprehensive Mahayana school that just includes all the things, right? So the other major esoteric lineage in Japan is called Shingo. Um, <clears throat> uh, this right here is Kobo Daishi Kukai, or Kukai, the the great teacher who spread the Dharma. Um, he was also part of this delegation to go to China to learn about esoteric Buddhism, but Saicho returned sooner. Um, so when, when Kukai finally returns, he's kind of, he kind of languishes in obscurity for a little while because Saicho was already returned and he's teaching at the capital. And you know, no one knows that actually Kukai went to, you know, you know instead of studying on Mount Tiantai, Kukai went to the Chang'an capital, the capital of the Tang dynasty, and studied with the, the very top scholars of the esoteric arts, uh, monks from India and China, and um, you know, ha ha had a much broader education. He also stayed in China longer than Saicho, learned Sanskrit and did all this stuff. So he comes back, and as the story goes, Kukai was the emperor found out that Kukai was recognized in China for his excellent calligraphy. So the emperor of Japan invites Kukai up to, to see his calligraphy, at, at which time Kukai is like, oh, by the way, I have been studying the esoteric arts like, like crazy, and I brought all this stuff back. And, then, and once Kukai's facility with esoteric Buddhism was understood, he then is um, put it, you know, kind of builds a relationship with the monastic bureau, right? So remember, Saicho wants institutional autonomy, Kukai goes and works for the monastic bureau and ends up running it um, and kind of establishes esoteric Buddhism as part of the ritual program of the elite temples. Um, we often think of Kukai as the founder of a distinct school of Buddhism. Um, I think that works in the case of Saicho, perhaps. With Kukai, it's a little more complicated because he's not just setting up and setting up a new shop. He's rather teaching his uh, contemporaries that the insights of the esoteric tradition uh, that Buddhahood is already within or that Buddhahood is, is animating reality, um, that it's already within all the other stuff they were already doing. They just need to learn the ritual component to bring it to life, right? So this uh, 10 levels of mind is one, is Kukai's way of kind of using esoteric Buddhism to encapsulate the diversity of Buddhism. So 
uh, level one, we have animalistic thinking. Level two, we have the, you know, thinking like a stupid child or a Confucian. I know, right? Um, and then level three is like a smart child, which he equated with uh, Hinduism and Taoism. Level four is understanding the truth of no self, which he associated with non-Mahayana or Shravaka Buddhism. Um, number five is understanding the freedom from karma, like a Pratyeka Buddha. Number six is the recognition of the interdependence of all beings. That's like Yogacara Buddhism. Number seven is knowing that the mind is originally unborn. This is Madhyamaka or emptiness thought. Next, we have uh, the, idea, the idea that all vehicles are one. It's like, this is like Tendai Buddhism, which itself draws heavily upon Madhyamaka. And next we have the Avatamsaka Sutra, that the mind is without own nature. So again, it's kind of, you know, looking more deeply at emptiness. And then number 10 is the, the mind of mystical adornment or the, the, mon, the secret mantra teachings. And normally this is thought of as being hierarchically oriented. You start at the bottom and you work your way up. But actually, in, with, the, with the Shingon monks that I've, that I've worked with and I've spoken to, take that hierarchy and turn it on its side. You can read it vertically. You can also read it horizontal, horizontally, wherein the fundamental insights of the esoteric tradition, that Buddhahood is animating all things, that we are body, speech, and mind, one with Buddha reality, that means that even within the lower ranks, Buddhahood is already there. It just needs to be awakened, right? So if you're a scholar of Madhyamaka or Sanron or uh, Hoso Yogacara or Tendai or Kegon or the Avatamsaka Sutra or, or whatever else, um, by learning, you know, by entering into a relationship with a teacher, studying the esoteric arts, you can realize your own Buddhahood right here and now. That's the story. Yeah. So again, we can read this vertically. We, all, we can also look at the deeper meaning that which it kind of reveals this kind of horizontal view that actually these 10 are all uh, interconnected as well. One of the teachings we find associated with Kukai is Sokushin Jōbutsu, or Buddhahood in this very body. This is often recognized as Kukai's main doctrinal contribution, but in fact, Kukai didn't invent this. So this is actually found in the, the thought of other Buddhist thinkers like Tiantai Jiri, for example, and other Mahayana masters. But this kind of, uh, you know, the, this, this idea that doctrine is somewhat less important than a ritual, because in the ritual context, body, speech, and mind are re realized to be, um, you know, expressions of Buddha reality. Uh, it's not that you do the ritual and you become a Buddha. It's actually more like you do the ritual and realize you were already participating in Buddha reality all along. That's kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, so I already mentioned the womb realm mandala, uh, the one on the left, this represents the universe in its quiescent state. And on the right, we have the Vajra realm mandala. Now, according to Kukai, when he was in China, they performed this um, initiation into the mandalas where uh, he was blindfolded and, and held, out a, uh, held out a flower and the flower dropped on the mandala and it landed right in the center. Um, each time landing on the Buddha Mahavarochana. So that was his special connection with the cosmic Buddha Mahavarochana um, in both mandalas. Now, <clears throat> um, many years ago when I was living in Japan, uh, I, I went to Mount Koya, which is the, the, the mountain practice site where Kukai uh, is said to have entered into eternal samadhi. Um, so rather than dying, Kukai enters into eternal samadhi. And when I was on Koyasan, I was able to receive kind of a lay initiation into these two mandalas. Um, the first time I went, you know, I'm blindfolded, candlelit room, there's you know, these you know, monks around, and all, and all the people that have come to do this thing are, you know, kind of one after another, dropping the flower on the mandala. And the first time I got Mahavarochan, I was like, whoa, this is fantastic, just like Kukai. Go back, you know, five, six months later and do it again. This time for the Vajrarel mandala and there it is. I, I got the Mahavrochana again. I was like, wow, what luck. But then I asked my teachers, like, wait, did I really get it just like Kukai? Did I really, did it really land on both? And my teacher said, no, of course not. It's not about getting your special Buddha from the mandala. It's about you developing a relationship with Kukai on Mount Koya. Now, this place, Koyasan, is a very important um, uh, pilgrimage site, uh, for, uh, especially from the medieval era. Um, Kukai wanted to train his monks in the esoteric arts, but the emperor, uh, uh, but you know, the capital is a very busy place. You know, it's a very lucrative place to be doing Buddhist practice. And he wanted his monks to go practice far away. Um, uh, so the emperor gave him this, this site uh, south of the capital that at the time perhaps took two weeks to get there. And nowadays it takes a couple hours, but um, then in 833, 
Instead of dying, Kukai enters into eternal samadhi on top of the mountain, you know, it's according to tradition, uh, and is waiting for the Bodhisattva Maitreya to appear to, you know, to, to spread the Dharma again um, on Koyasan. Uh, Kukai is treated as a Bodhisattva-like figure that is active in the world. And um, not only is Koyasan often treated as a pure land in, within this earth, but I said that many of the pl specific places within Koyasan are actually connected with different pure lands, the pure land of the Medicine Buddha, Amitabha Buddha, the Maitreya's Tush to Heaven, and so on. Um, while initially successful, Koyasan falls into a period of disrepair until the 11th and 12th century, where it's kind of revitalized and becomes a major uh, pilgrimage site. Now, nowadays, the Shingon tradition basically gets to dominate the conversation on esoteric Buddhism. But here's the thing, right? So like I said, Kukai worked within the Nara establishment, you know, sharing the esoteric teachings so that, um, you know, the great temples like Todaiji, Kofukuji, and so on um, could, could begin these ritual programs for, for the protection of the state, a long life of the emperor, and so on. Um, <clears throat> but then, um, you know, Saicho's uh, uh, Ryakuji lineage um, on Mount Hiei is right next to the capital, right? So that means that the um, uh, that they were able to maintain closer relationship with the aristocrats in the capital, and that made Tendai Buddhism the dominant lineage um, in terms of esoteric Buddhist thought, Pure Land Buddhist thought, Buddhist philosophy, whatever. Um, so they remained a dominant tradition. But nevertheless, Koyasan was an important place that people were going to, and because Koyasan was so far away, um, when you know during the Warring States period, when many things are burned down. Koyasan was actually able to, to retain and preserve a lot of the esoteric lineages that otherwise got obliterated. Um, later medieval Koyasan is kind of divided into a three-tier system with the scholar amongst the top, uh, the ritual practitioners, and the hijri. The hijri is this really interesting class of kind of wandering ascetics. Uh, they're often engaged in, in menbutsu practice, chanting the name of the Buddha Amitabha, as well as some, uh, you know, perhaps this uh, esoteric rituals as well. Um, 1413, the, the, uh, some of the unorthodox Nembutsu practices are banned, um, or perhaps they just quit writing about them because they couldn't control them because they're like cats, you can't herd the cats, you know? Anyway, um, Mount Hiei is eventually burned down by one of the, by one of the, uh, the, the warlords, Oda Nobunaga. Um, and when Mount Hiei is burned down, that really negatively affects the Tendai tradition. It, 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 some people say it's kind of like if you were to burn down the Vatican in the middle of the medieval period. Think of what that would have done uh, to, to Catholicism, right? So, the, so Tendai is kind of put in check, um, broken down, um, eventually is rehabilitated, but never gets to the point of being like a dominant tradition like it was in the medieval period. As a result, the monks who get to kind of dominate the conversation on esoteric Buddhism are coming from the Shingon lineage. That's really, I think, when you know we begin to really think of it as kind of you know uh, as a, as a thing unto itself. Yeah. Um, so this has been a quick overview of some of the um, different aspects of, um, you know, esoteric Buddhism, quick overview of some of the uh, tantric traditions that uh, esoteric Buddhism is drawing upon, some of the developments in China, uh, as well as some of the developments in Japan. Um, but, uh, you know, at some point, perhaps we'll talk about some of the other esoteric traditions like esoteric Zen or esoteric Pure Land, uh, and so on. So. I'm going to go ahead and stop there and I look forward to hearing any of your questions.